I'm at Fatufifi on the Karikari Peninsula at the top of the North Island, about 30 kilometres east of Kaitaia. Clear, warm water, broad sandy beaches and lush green landscapes, birds in the trees, fish in the sea and plenty of space for everyone. New Zealand's a beautiful country, but this place is exceptional. I'm not the only person to think that. Shanghai Cred, a Chinese-owned property development company, plans to spend a billion dollars here, building what could be New Zealand's largest tourist resort on what used to be Māori land. Not everyone is happy about this. They tell us it's progress and it'll be good for us, but we haven't seen anything of that yet. Katarina Rind is one of a number of locals opposed to the development. It's supposed to give us employment. Yeah, that's not happening. We're not talking about immigration here, or not exactly. This is about foreign investment, but it's also about the scale of the project, the volume of people that would come to a proposed 750-unit luxury hotel and the impact it will have on the local environment. Overall view of it is... We definitely don't need it up here. We're going to change our peninsula if we allow that many people by the figures that they're giving us. It's just going to change the peninsula real bad. Ngāti Kahu has a reputation for contacting people directly and saying, welcome into our rohe, but you are in our rohe. We have a history of engaging with all the manuhiri who live in our, in our rohe. You can do whatever you want. Just don't do something that will take away from us what is rightfully ours. Anahira Herbert Graves is CEO of Te Runanga o Iwi Nati Kahu. Her organisation are working with Shanghai Cred and have signed an agreement outlining their conditions for support. There is also that real fear that our fisheries is going to just go kaput, our waters are going to be polluted beyond belief. Then there's the fear that we'll all end up speaking Chinese. I'm like, yeah, you know, that actually has happened already once in this country and it wasn't done by people who look like Asians. On the unspoiled east coast of the far north, locally we debating how best to engage with powerful foreigners offering them a deal in exchange for the right to use the land as they see fit. The difficulty inherent in trying to understand how that will play out. It's hard not to hear an echo of Waitangi. We still hold on to the values that were there in 1840. Margaret Mutu is Professor of Māori Studies at Auckland University and the Chair of Ngāti Kahu's Runanga. And have hopefully learnt a bit more about how to deal with immigrants having had some pretty bitter experiences over the past 170 years. So we're hoping that we have get it right, but we know we won't get it all right. Professor Motu says working with Shanghai Cred is simply pragmatic. It's going to come whether we like it or not. Let's make sure that what does come doesn't end up destroying who we are and those very precious territory that's been handed down to us through the centuries. So just very painfully aware of the need to proceed so carefully Still, not everyone's convinced. Those few Marys that are saying, yeah, it's really good for us, need to look at a bigger picture. We're looking at not my generation, not my grandchildren, but five generations down from us. What are we going to leave them? What are you most worried about changing? Yeah, where do we start? In association with Massey University, this is Slice of Heaven, a podcast series about immigration at a time when more people are coming to New Zealand than ever before. In this, our final episode, we're looking at what happens next. We'll talk about whether we can get past racism in the immigration debate, the media and their evolving influence, and what kinds of policy New Zealand might find useful. We'll finish by looking into the future and asking, where do we go from here? Back in Farafifi, Shanghai Cred told us via email that they were waiting on resource consent before answering questions, but that their relationship with Nati Kahu has been positive, with mutual respect and understanding for cultural values and tradition. Still, there's a feeling of worlds colliding. How much money do you need? You know, that's enough. I think that's, that's more than enough. 
One of Katarina's neighbours has put up homemade signs on her fence, protesting the proposed development, saying things like mana, not millions. One or two have been modified, but you can still see the writing underneath. No invasion was originally no Asian invasion. When she talked about those things, she said, you know, just be, you have to be really careful how you put it out there. And, and that was Asian evasion thing, but you need to whip that off because that's Mary's been, been an asshole. <laughs> Winston Peters, the MP for Northland, says he doesn't care whether Shanghai Crowd are from China or Luxembourg. His concern is that any benefits will be going offshore. All we may be doing is lending our resource and our environment for exploitation by an outside interest. Uh, We've seen enough examples of that around the world. And so I think uh, what the Maori and local uh, people, European In fact, all Northerners will be interested to know is, what exactly is the economic script here? And he underlines the potential for crossed wires. Good faith, though, is a cultural concept. Margaret Mutu says while she remains cautious, her academic research into Chinese-Mari relations and many shared cultural values make for optimism. If you open up the door for the relationship in the right way and you're open and very clear about what your conditions are, then in my experience, the Chinese will always be respectful of that. And they're also very upfront themselves. Nati Kahu cultivates that relationship. Each year we take a cultural delegation up to Shanghai to meet with them on their own grounds and to understand how the way they think. And of course, what we see up there uh, just blows us away because it is so totally different from Kari Kari Peninsula. But the reality is that the, you are dealing with people and the, that very strong cultural requirement of the Māori world that the most important thing in the world is people. And people must get on with people. Anna Hira Herbert Graves believes language will be key to opening up understanding. I'm thinking my mokopuna learn Mandarin. I'm learning Mandarin. I learn Mandarin. You fellas learn Māori. There will be a shift in the demographics which will end up seeing this not necessarily as a white New Zealand. That is changing. And with that will come a change in society itself where the need for everyone to be controlled by white culture and always come under white culture and you couldn't do anything but speak English. You walk down the streets of Auckland now, you hear multiple languages. It's just happening as a matter of course. This is exactly the kind of thing some people are afraid of. But not Associate Professor and Migration Researcher Robin Peace of Massey University. She says New Zealanders should be thinking proactively. Where is the onus on me to learn to speak Chinese with the new migrant populations that are coming into New Zealand? So I think, yes, language is really important. So are you suggesting that that language needs to be reciprocal, that that people who live here now should be learning new languages in order to be able to interact with migrants? Yes, absolutely. We are very monolingual for a bicultural, let alone any other kind of cultural society. We are very monolingual. Not everyone has to has to speak all, all all of the, what is it, 150 probably other languages, but at least a kind of presumption that being able to speak languages other than our, than our own enables us to stand in other people's shoes in different ways. You certainly don't want a situation that we are potentially heading towards in New Zealand where it is not easy for people to feel a sense of social cohesion within New Zealand if they are newcomers. That idea of social cohesion is something we all want. It's the glue that binds us together through the things we share, seeing our values reflected in the world around us and wanting to be part of it. Still, to be honest, at 38 years old, learning Mandarin feels like a stretch, for me anyway. 
But I'd love for my daughter to be able to speak more than one language, to share that sense of understanding directly with another culture and its people. It doesn't mean we give up any part of ourselves. If anything, it gives us a richer take on life. Meet Jenny Lim from Harbour Sport on Auckland's North Shore. 大家好，我是 Jenny Lim 林静瑜，我是这个 Hub Sport 啊、um, 北岸体育社区的协调员。I see myself as very much Chinese, but also very much Kiwi, um, and very Malaysian. And I think I am I am all of that. Jenny came to New Zealand from Malaysia in 2004. As the North Shore becomes a hub for immigrant communities, she says it's important to continue to see people as individuals. We always talk about the Chinese community as one.、Uh, in fact, we talk about the Asian community as one. It's one of the most diverse continents there are.、Um, but then we also talk about the Chinese community as one. But then you get、um, first generation Chinese, you get fifth generation Chinese in New Zealand.、Um, we engage with. Young high school Chinese students are very different to how we engage with Chinese parents.、Um, so yes, it's increasingly diverse in terms of ethnicity, but increasingly diverse in a magnitude of different ways as well. Not all of us can or want to walk between two worlds, but even if we decide not to learn new languages, the approach the established population takes to this influx of new New Zealanders will have a big impact on how it works out for all of us. It's easy to when you come across a challenge working cross culturally to to think about that other person and what that other person has done to create this conflict. But a lot of times we we need to look at ourselves and what role we play in immigration. Maybe and in diversity, and I think that's always a positive thing. When you are challenged to better yourself, you are challenged to look beyond your box and your world, because our, you know, our world is getting more and more global. Even though we're tucked away at the bottom of the globe, we are a lot more connected now than we are we have ever been. If social cohesion binds us together, racism tears us apart. Metro columnist and RNZ journalist Leilani Momoisea is a New Zealander of Samoan and Palangi heritage. Her parents were targeted in the dawn raids. You know, in my mum's house, getting raided, the police thinking that my dad was still living there, and this is because of immigration, because of because of racism attached to immigration policies, where the majority of temporary immigrants were from Australia and the UK. But Pacific Islanders were targeted. You know, these are the things that we carry with ourselves that are attached to immigration. There's no way you can tell me that that wasn't racist. It's very hard to get away from the emotional side of that when that's what happened, and that happened not so long ago. You know, like my mum. That happened in my mum and dad's day. You know. These days, prejudices tend to be more subtle, but that doesn't mean they aren't there. Yeah, so I think on the surface, where are you from, seems innocent, but it's usually everything that comes after that question or everything attached to that question. So, usually, if someone says where are you from, and if you reply I'm from New Zealand, normally what comes after that is no, but where are you really from? They don't want to know that you're from here. They want to know why you look the way you look, or they want to know, well, you're brown, so why are you here? Basically, that's sort of been my experience anyway, and other people I've talked to, that's been their experience too. People will protest. It's just a conversation starter. And look, I've been guilty of this myself. But if you're telling yourself that, here's a question: At a neighbor's barbecue, how would you open a conversation to someone who looks like you? Wouldn't it be more like, "What do you do?" If it's almost unconscious, somehow baked in to the point where it's effectively invisible, being able to see this attitude is useful because then it can be challenged. Unfortunately, calling someone racist is such a powerful charge. The target tends to drop into a defensive crouch and return fire. If you're called racist, then maybe have a think about why that is, rather than immediate denial. You know, because if you're being called racist, there's probably a reason why you're being called racist. You can be a good person and be ignorant, you know, but no one's going to be able to、uh, address their ignorance unless they admit to it. 
And that refusal to address prejudice misleads us when it comes to understanding how attitudes are influenced and public confidence in immigration eroded. We're often not, when I say we, I don't mean Pacific Islanders, I mean all sorts of minorities. We often are the scapegoats for, we're the scapegoats for other people when something doesn't work for the government. The toxic nature of those kinds of arguments has polluted political discourse. Green Party co-leader James Shaw says it's got to the point where it's impossible to engage in a reasoned debate about immigration. Until we're able to have a more mature conversation uh, than where it's currently being held, you know, I'm very reluctant to get into a, a conversation around specific numbers because it just devolves into places that we don't want to be. While James Shaw accepts partial responsibility for the degraded immigration discussion, he backs co-leader Materia Torres calling out of Winston Peters as racist. As to how we get past racism in the debate... Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. That is something that I'm, I'm wrestling with. We're going to need to do better than that. One of the problems has been that tacit, almost unconscious acceptance of prejudice. For a long time, it's just been the air that we breathed. Until relatively recently, generations of New Zealanders were taught that Abel Tasman discovered the country. But Māori are being written back into history. I think we have a big part to play in that as broadcasters. Mihi Narangi Forbes presents The Hui on TV3 and is RNZ's Māori Affairs correspondent. A listener who may have grown up in a really middle-class white environment and not... You know, and did grow up with poor karikariana and rotten banana and thought that, you know, Abel Tasman did um, come to New Zealand and forgot about all those other people that came first. You know, it, you you can kind of forgive that person for, for feeling a little bit angry when people start throwing around, you know, $300 million and $6 million of it just got spent and wasted here. I get that, but um, that's our role as broadcasters and as community and as leaders and as politicians to make sure that we give the backstory and the context to things because... Because once you've heard the story of Waikato and the invasion and, you know, the murders and the drownings in the rivers, you kind of go, wow, shivers, that wasn't that much, $270 million for all that land that was stolen. But it's about context and that's our role. We're storytellers. And most New Zealanders don't mind listening to a story. The way those stories are told makes a difference. If biculturalism is still a long way off in practice, Middle New Zealand is coming round to understanding how badly Māori have been treated. We can do the same with immigrants, or we can amplify fears, from jihadi brides to Asian-sounding surnames on property buyers' documents. Politicians have enjoyed getting overwrought about foreigners, and the media has given them a platform. I tell my friends, and uh, when they come across and talking to me about comparing New Zealand and Afghanistan and stuff like that. Zach Hazaranajad is one of the refugees known as the Tampa Boys. They came to New Zealand in 2001 after the boat they were in was rejected by Australia. He now works as a real estate agent in South Auckland, but he's talking about Kiwi's perception of terrorism in his birthplace. When I tell them that there's 40 million odd people living on that country and you hear a small minority of people doing like this. Um, imagine that if if I take this TV7, Police 10 7 that uh, uh, program, and I, if, I, if I take this in Afghanistan and show it to those people, they think that, OK, New Zealand is like this. That's the kind of insight that takes some of the drama out of news and keeps it a little more real. You must always blow on the pie. I'm hungry. Always blow on the pie. Safe communities together. It isn't just about the story. It's also about who's telling the story. Tim Murphy is the co-editor of newsroom.co.nz and the former editor-in-chief of the New Zealand Herald. We view our newsrooms as networks, so every one of the people in it have their own networks beyond the newsroom walls, if you like. And so if you have 100 people, when you have 100 times 100, say, uh, people they might know, family, friends, students, fellow, you know, neighbours, whatever... But if your network of networks isn't bringing in that representation, then you're not, A, making the right, probably, assessments and judgments among yourselves as a group of some issues, but B, you're not 
you know, getting to people in those networks either to find out what's going on. As a group of reporters in Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch, or wherever we are, we should be able to reflect our own communities. So I would say in Auckland, we should have more Pacific Island reporters here in this newsroom so that when we do go into these communities that are predominantly Pacific Islanders, they see their own faces and they want to share their stories with us. Public perception feeds into political action. It's never a great time to be a refugee, particularly when you're trying to get to Australia and there's an election looming. Zach says an Australian cabinet minister visited him and his fellow Tampa boys at their new school in Auckland in the weeks after the result. When she came here, visited us at Selwyn College, she publicly said with us where the teachers and other people were sitting, and she said, uh, we, our party is quite lucky that we won the election because of you guys. And we had our um, stats done and we were quite firm that if we stop these people coming through, we will win the election. Reading the polls and acknowledging political realities just makes sense if you're a politician. Or does it? No, I disagree. Values are not based on electoral cycle. This is all about values. Jim Bolger was Prime Minister from 1990 to 1997. Leadership is about values. What values does this individual, that political group, uh, this society stand for? And what I'm talking about, what is right? 2001 was a year when uh, 9-11 attack happened in the US. The world was uh, sceptical of uh, refugees, people especially coming from third world countries. But Helen Clark showed a huge leadership to the world that uh, we cannot blame a huge population of uh, one continent for the fact that the minority people for their own political view want to destroy the world. And in the case of the Tampa boys, Helen Clark, Prime Minister at the time, as she was from 1999 to 2008, saw the polls swing around dramatically as she told RNZ's podcast The Ninth Floor. The first sort of shock jock polls were, were horrible, you know, maybe 89% against taking these people. But when the decision was made and the reasons were set out, public opinion did change quite significantly. And over time, I think one of the really nice things about New Zealand is that people took the Afghan refugees, particularly the miners, to their hearts and followed the stories of uh, what happened with these, these boys. That back and forth between what people think and what politicians do is at the heart of democracy. The trick is having the vision to predict how a situation will play out. One of the recurring themes in the immigration discussion is New Zealand's lack of infrastructure. Economist Shamabil Jacob says we're feeling the pinch of population pressures now because we haven't thought ahead. And that isn't likely to change unless we change our thinking. The challenge with infrastructure is that these are big ticket items. They take a long time to plan, long time to invest in. And if you're not sure the demand is going to be there, you probably don't want to invest in it. And I think that's the trap we're in, that we're kind of building infrastructure that's kind of just enough for the population we have now rather than the population we will have in the future. As he sees it, the solution is to start by understanding where we're going. But a population strategy can be as simple as saying, look, we want to be a country of, say, 5 million people or 15 million people. Then you can have a much more detailed conversation about the types of people, when they come in, how they come in, and how you pay for the infrastructure and all those things that go with it. Labour's immigration spokesperson, Ian Lees Galloway, says he's not against the idea in principle, but it isn't as straightforward as it sounds. As soon as you raise the idea of a population policy... Everybody has a different idea of uh, what the ideal population of New Zealand is, uh, and everybody comes at it from different perspectives. And Minister for Immigration Michael Woodhouse is dead against it. The arbitrary nature of setting a population policy comes with even greater risks. My own view is that uh, New Zealand needs a population and a labour workforce that is commensurate with its aspirations and its the opportunities that it sees now, and that it shouldn't be limited in that arbitrarily by a fixed figure. This will continue to be complicated. Understanding that immigration policy is interconnected with so many other elements of government, from the environment to employment, housing to health, infrastructure to education, is just the first step.
Michael Woodhouse emphasises the importance of perception. My biggest challenge probably, I think, would be to, to try and get cut through on a clearer message, a plainer message about the benefits of good immigration policy to New Zealand that doesn't get interfered with for political or fearful reasons. It's an election year. I don't know that I'm going to be too successful in that, but I do think there's a willingness to listen to why immigration policy is so important to get right and how it benefits New Zealand in the long run. And while we can always do better, New Zealand has no reason to feel ashamed. Right around the world, immigration is challenging. Khalid Kosser runs a Geneva-based fund to prevent extremism in immigrant communities and is chairman of the World Economic Forum's Council on Migration. He says New Zealand is a world leader in making immigration work and we need to step up. I think New Zealand's always been rather modest about it. I think New Zealand has relatively small numbers, is, is well managed, but hasn't, as far as I can see, been particularly vocal about its success. And I think perhaps the time is coming, especially as migration is, is under siege in places like Europe, for places like New Zealand to be a bit more vocal about their success, about what works, about what might be learned in other places, and perhaps being a bit, bit, much of a, a, a bit louder of a champion for migration. I think we need you. No one's pretending we can hug it all out. Hard choices, choices that affect people's lives, are being made. They have to be. But as we go into an election and beyond, it's up to us to keep thinking about immigration, to keep looking for a place that reflects us and the way we want to be. If we remember back to the first immigration agreement, the treaty signed at Waitangi in 1840, this country has changed in ways no one could have predicted. And if we can't see exactly what the future holds, what we do know is that different voices, different viewpoints will all be a part of leading us forward. That's what makes us, us. Lisa Matisu-Smith. People don't all arrive at once. Um, Whether that's New Zealand, I think that there were multiple uh, waka that arrived in New Zealand over a period of time. Jock Phillips. You can see... 19th century New Zealand Parker society as being much more monocultural than it really was. You know, you would have heard a lot of very different accents if you'd been on a train in, the, in New Zealand in the 1870s. I live in a land of hot water I live in a land of smiles Leanne Dalziel People talk about immigration solving a problem, you know, in terms of the ageing population, various other things like that. But actually immigration, it's it's what we've always done. Paul Spoonley. We need to have a long-term view because the immigrants are not going to disappear anytime soon. They've fundamentally changed the demography of our communities. They've changed supply and demand in our core institutions. And we need to understand the long-term as well as the short-term impacts. Michael Woodhouse. We are a landmass of about the size of the United Kingdom and Japan, who have 80 and 120 million people respectively. I really don't think it, it, it's appropriate to say that somehow we're filling up. Jim Bolger. If there's shortages of infrastructure, just to use a topical issue, then we uh, just get about planning and building the infrastructure. That's uh, not complex. It's straightforward. It's been done for thousands of years. Infrastructure's been built. So let's get on with it. I live in a land of so different sides So I can smoke my pipe on my estate Matthew Hooten. As far as I know, neither Bill English nor Phil Goff has ever given a speech telling Aucklanders why a 2.5 million population is a good idea by 2030. And they should, if they believe it. And if they don't believe it's a good idea, then they should stop it from happening. Simon Wilson. We are going to be able to make all sorts of choices about uh, who we want. Um, And I hope we make them knowing that the richness of a society is, uh, is predicated on having all sorts of people being able to buy and being able to have a stake in the society. It's, it's, it's not based on um, just creaming off the richest people we can find or whatever. Mei Chen. The best way to grow someone's cultural capability, which is the ability to work with people who are not like them, is to understand their own culture. 
And I think New Zealanders need to spend more time thinking about what is fundamental to Kiwi culture. What is it that they really value and appreciate and that they want to keep? I live in this land you frown upon. I live in this land of hot sand. Shamabil Yakob. We took it pretty seriously and, you know, my dad certainly speaks very regularly, even even now, to me, about my responsibilities as a citizen of this country. Winston Peters. These people are not skilled IT workers. They're not all these skilled workers you're claiming to the be. They're the very reverse. They're horribly unskilled. And that's what Treasury is saying. That's what the international commentary is saying. That's what the OECD is saying about us. So why are we persisting with this idea that we bring highly skilled immigration when in the main we're not? Julie Fry. A couple of years ago, then Prime Minister John Key had a meeting with then Prime Minister David Cameron in which he said, migration is a vote winner as long as you can convince people you've got it under control. Leonie Hayden. I'm so reluctant to say coming here and taking our jobs because it's the catch cry of the racist old man. I live in this land of Rome This land I live lies in this land This land I live lies in Maybe we're not being targeted so much anymore, but other groups are being targeted, and that makes us feel uncomfortable because if we haven't lived it ourselves, we've grown up with those stories. Oscar Kitely. And I read the comment section after particular columns that I write, you know, online, and I'm like, what the hell? You know, just just nasty people, just people expressing their, uh, using the anonymity of the web to express their complete vile natures and they, but I have to accept well these are New Zealanders too. I live in this land of Rome. This land I live flies in this land. This land I live flies in this land. Zach has a Ranajad. We are quite lucky to be in this country and wherever we go we feel that everybody is part of each other. And Christine Dorsey. If you look at the younger generation, I have a daughter out at intermediate school and she's totally fascinated because they have a boy in their class straight from Tonga, no English at all. And so she's just learnt a lot. She comes home every day with interesting stories and about how she's trying to support him. And I think they just see it as part of life. They don't see it as different. Young people are already getting really used to this, so I think as the population ages, they're just going to be more accepted because that's what they've grown up with.